Hi, welcome to my presentation. My name is Sherelle Pindley and today my presentation will be based on the response of oral sulfonylurea to permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus. Now, the purpose of this paper is to show the successful transfer from insulin to oral sulfonylurea. Now, the oral sulfonylurea are hypoglycemic drugs which are used for people with diabetes. These drugs are, all, are used to lower the blood glucose levels. Now, this was performed in a three-year-old girl who was diagnosed with permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus. It's a rare disease that's found in one in 500,000 newborns. It was found that neonates seem to have an intrauterine growth retardation, which is due to the intrauterine insulin deficiency. They also presented with glucosuria, which is glucose in the urine, polyuria, a failure to thrive, and also ketoacidosis, all of which displayed within the first six months of life. Now, the administration of insulin could result in a dramatic improvement and in growth. It can also present in two forms, permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus and transient neonatal diabetes mellitus. Now, the permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus is a rare form of diabetes. It's caused by a mutation in the KCNJ11 gene. Now, the R2O1H mutation in the KCNJ11 gene is the gene that encodes for the KIR6.2 subunit of the potassium channel of the pancreatic beta cell. Now, this has occurred due to it being damaged and one of the bases being replaced with another. The coding has changed and affected the whole chromosome. Now, this is what leads to the gene being mutated and the disease being present. Now, the potassium inwardly rectifying channel subfamily member J, member 11, is also known as the KCNJ11 gene. It is the gene that is responsible for making the subunits of the ATP sensitive potassium channel. The potassium ATP channel consists of eight subunits, four from the KCNJ11 gene and four from another gene, which we won't go into in this presentation, but just to let you know, they have come from another gene. The potassium ATP channels are found in the beta cells, which are the cells that secrete the hormone insulin. Now, mutations within the KCNJ11 gene are the common cause of permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus. Now, if you just basically, um, we've just got a little, I've got a little picture of the chromosome as well. And it just shows you that it's located on the short arm of the chromosome and it's located at position 15.1. The yellow arrow, if you just take a look, will show you that there. Okay, so now if you take a look if, at this one, this slide just here, shown here is the DNA sequence analysis of the patient. Now, the patient was a three-year-old female. Uh, you, as you can see from the data shown on the slide, the mutation has occurred and the base G has been replaced with A. You can see where this location has occurred if you just take a look. Now, the little girl was born at 40 weeks, um, weighing 4.4 pounds. She was born to a healthy mother with no trace of diabetes. She was admitted to the hospital with an acute illness and presented with fever diarrhea and vomiting. Um, she was found to have hypoglycemia and her blood glucose levels was above 20 millimolar per litre. There was no clinical or biochemical evidence of ketoacidosis but her hypoglycemia was persistent so she was started on subcutaneous insulin isophane. This was administered, administered to her twice daily. Okay. So, um, as I said, it was administ administered to her twice daily. Um, she was diagnosed as having a de novo heterozygous mutation in the KCNJ11 gene and was transferred from subcutaneous insulin to an oral glabenclamide. Now, this is an anti-diabetic drug. It works by increasing insulin binding and sensitivity at receptor sites by stimulating insulin release from the beta cells in the pancreas and reducing blood glucose levels. At the age of two years old, the little girl was again transferred to the hospital and there were several tests that were performed. Um, again, her blood glucose readings were taken. They were taken before and after being administered the oral sulfonylurea. 
there was a dramatic improvement in the blood glucose levels after the oral sulfonylurea was administered. Okay, now before, I should just start off by saying that the normal levels for the HbA1c in a person who hasn't got diabetes would be 3.5 to 5.5%. Um, if the levels was around 6.5% in someone with diabetes, that would be a good level, basically. Um, before she was administered the oral sulfonylurea, her HbA1c was measured at, was measured at 10.7%. Her fasting blood glucose was 5.6 millimolars per litre. And two hours after being administered, her glucose levels was 20.1 millimolar per litre. Now, her blood glucose was monitored four to six times per day. Her glucose was in the range of 15 to 18.6 millimolar per litre, and her insulin was measured at 150 picomolar per litre. Her C peptide was in the range of less than 0 0.5 nanograms per mil. Um, also, I should just state as well that the um, the HbA1c is just, it's basically all about the haemoglobin levels. So it's a way to check that the diabetes is under control and um, it can tell you how high your blood glucose levels are. So again, um, this slide is just showing that after she was administered the oral clobenclamide and we've got several readings here as well. So the data recorded, basically she was weaned off insulin eight days after starting the glabenclamide and her blood glucose levels was monitored, monitoring was continued. And we got readings of her preprandial glucose was in the range of 3.6 to 8.2 millimolars per litre. There was a midnight monitoring of glucose and it was also in the range of 3.6 to 10.8 millimolar per litre. Now, Eight weeks later, while she was still on glabenclamide, there was no episode of hyperglycemia or diarrhea. Um, again, 24 weeks after starting the glabenclamide, she still continued to show improvement and her capillary blood glucose um, continued. It was monitored, but this was done at home and it showed that it was almost within the normal range and her HbA1c had dropped to 5.9%. So this just shows that the patient was compliant with the medications. Um, okay, um, her results, sorry, eight weeks after show that her capillary blood glucose was in the range of 5.5 to 8 millimolar and her HbA1c had decreased from 10.7 to 7.1 percent. The insulin levels was registered, measured at 19 picomoles per litre. Um, just to let you know also that a normal range of blood glucose levels would normally be from 4 to 7 millimolar per litre. So when hers was first registered, it just showed that it was way above the levels that it should have been. Basically, just to conclude, what we've shown is that mutations within the KCNJ11 gene are the cause of permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus. Pearson et al. also showed that the successful switch from insulin to oral sulfonylurea in 90% of patients within the KCNJ11 mutation. This is also the first case of a successful switch from insulin to oral sulfonylurea in a patient with the R2O1H mutation. Thank you for listening. The end.